Um, Colleen and I are going to you know, try to take about half an hour each this morning to talk about uh, well, something we call Madisonian federalism. Uh, the adjective Madisonian appears a lot these days in the literature of political science and history. Uh, we talk a lot about the Madisonian Constitution. In fact, we assume the Constitution is inherently a Madisonian document. There is some irony to this. Uh, Madison, if you know the history, Madison lost the proposals he cared most about, did not want to have the uh, federal Senate elected by the state legislatures. He did not think the state should be equally represented in the Senate. He wasn't, was not even convinced that each state should be represented in the Senate. Uh, he was uh, very partial to his uh, pet scheme to have a congressional negative on state laws, which ideally could be used both to protect the national government uh, against interference from the states and to intervene within the states individually uh, to protect minorities against unjust state legislation. He lost on all these points, and we know from letters he wrote to Jefferson that he left Philadelphia being somewhat disappointed uh, with the results of the convention. But being the kind of politician he was, and since we have a few living and breathing politicians in the room, I'm sure they'll sympathize with this, uh, he put his disappointments uh, you know, behind him and went on to the next issue and kind of recovered his, his good senses. Uh, and, and became an active politician. But to say we have a Madisonian constitution in one sense is a little bit problematic because he lost some of the points he valued most. On the other hand, I remain convinced, and I'm pretty sure Colleen would share this opinion, uh, that the architecture of the constitution and really the whole scheme for its adoption uh, was a very Madisonian idea that he, he set out uh, to set the agenda for the, for, the, for the convention. Even if he didn't win every proposal he wanted, its overall framework, I think, was consistent with his thinking. So what I think the two of us want to do this morning is to try to explain uh, what we'll call Madisonian federalism. And I'm going to take the lead here, and I'm going to try to sketch the, the historical background, uh, say something about the Articles of Confederation, say something about the evolution of Madison's thinking. Uh, I want us to spend a little time with, uh, with one single text, which I think is absolutely uh, essential to understand uh, the real core, the, you know, the kind of central premises of what Madison thought he was doing, uh, and then try to say a few words about the convention, and then Colleen will uh, take over and, you know, I think, talk in some of the more general terms about Madison's ideas about the federal structure. So let's start with um, uh, let's start with the you know the the original version of American federalism, uh, the Articles of Confederation, which were drafted in 1776, 1777, ratified by 1781, were in effect for eight years. Uh, essentially is a system of government that people started to say was imbecilic. That was the, the adjective they liked on the eve of the federal convention. Um, uh, two, basically two points I want to make about it, and then, then we'll move on fairly qu quickly. The first one actually has to do, has to do with the question of state sovereignty, uh, which Sad, Sad Barber you know, kind of rose at the very end of the previous session. So if we look at Article Two of the Confederation, and the text is up here uh, behind us, uh, it says, it says each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States and Congress assembled. There is an affirmation of state sovereignty uh, that was present in the Articles of the Confederation, and one could read this to mean that you know that principle was being affirmed uh, in the mid 1770s and you know in 1781. On the other hand. The powers expressly delegated to the United States and Congress assembled included essential sovereign powers, they include the powers over war and diplomacy, uh, which in many ways would be the highest part of what a sovereign government could do. Uh, and so one problem we have here is that while, while nominally reaffirming a theory of state sovereignty, certainly the states would have been uh, thought of as being wholly competent uh, to regulate what was called in the 18th century their internal police their internal government, uh, and to serve they're the only bodies which can legislate directly on the American citizens. On the other hand, essential facets of sovereignty were, were, you know, had been granted uh, to the national government from the very beginning. Uh, so I, I, I raise this question to say it seems to me that the American system has always been a system of divided sovereignty, that basically we destroyed the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty historically means within every regime there has to be one unified ultimate, final, absolute, irresistible source of power. American federalism basically destroys the idea of sovereignty, but we hold on to the term. And I think a lot of the confusion we have about sovereignty comes from the need to try to sort out exactly how we delegate or allocated 
the sovereign powers of government. So that's point number one. Point number two uh, is, uh, goes to trying to identify what was the underlying theory of federalism that worked under the Articles of Confederation before the federal constitution was adopted. Um, the phrase I'd like to use here is this is a system of uh, the which requires the voluntary compliance of the states with the resolutions, recommendations, and requisitions. And I use those three terms because they're the relevant language. Uh, the resolutions, recommendations, and requisitions of the Continental Congress, uh, which, which was the national government. The states have to voluntarily comply. They have to figure out the best way to implement federal measures. But their form of voluntary compliance would not have been understood in the same way, let's say, that John C. Calhoun in the 1830s might have conceived the nature of a federal system. The idea of voluntary compliance does not mean, did not mean your originally that the states were free to accept or reject what the national government asked them to do. Instead, the states were expected to figure out the best way to implement national policy. There was, a, you know, there was no national bureaucracy outside of the army. Uh, there was no national administrative state. Uh, the states would, would be responsible for making all kinds of decisions as to what would be the best way for a certain policy to go forward, uh, to legislate directly on their citizens to enforce it. It's a very different system, though, from saying the states have a right to judge independently whether or not the policy should be implemented. Under the Articles of Confederation, they were expected to implement uh, what, you know, what, what, what the policy was. So that's where we start. Uh, we want to go on and say a bit about James Madison in order to talk about the Madisonian Constitution. Uh, these are actually my two favorite portraits of Madison. Uh, the first, the one on the left, was done by Charles Wilson Peel in 1792. I like it because I think it's actually the most realistic. It's the one that's just in terms of the, you know, the visual representation. Uh, the second one uh, was done by Asher Durand in 1829. This one I love because it, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of a haunting image. You know, the, you know Madison, from this point on, the, the last time he ever left uh, his home in Montpelier in Orange, Virginia, was in 1829. The rest of his life he, he spent there, increasingly confined to a single room. Uh, so here, you know, the cheeks are drawn and, you know, are somewhat hollow and, He's visibly aged, but yeah, I just love the eyes. The kind of, there's a deep earnestness of expression, which I think is meant to reach out to all of us individually. Uh, so you know, that's, you know, that's Madison. Let me, uh, you know, but a better portrait actually for the period that we're talking about in the 1780s is this little thing that was done when Madison was courting uh, uh, Kitty Floyd, who was a, actually a 16-year-old daughter of a fellow congressman from New York. It's kind of a little, kind of more of affectionate portrait. This is the young Madison who becomes the framer of the Constitution in 1787. So let's leave him up here for a while, for a few minutes. So uh, Madison uh, went off to the Continental Congress in 1780. Uh, he'd served uh, a term in the Virginia Convention, a term in the Virginia legislature, was defeated for re-election, served a couple years on the Virginia Council, an advisory body to the governor. And then he was sent off to Congress in 1780. And like most members of Congress then, he stayed until he was term limited out of office. Those of you who like term limits, you remember that James Madison was the first guy to be first legislator to be term limited out, which might you know, give us some, well, to draw some inferences as to whether that term limits is a good idea uh, or not. He served in Congress for three and a half years without going home once. Very unusual. Most most delegates would serve three or four months and go home. Uh, might come back for a second term. Um, but while he was there in Congress in the early 1780s, he formed a set of conclusions. Uh, about the Articles of Confederation just as they were taking effect. Uh, he was convinced from the outset that they're probably inadequate. And Madison served on a committee that was supposed to figure out what should Congress do now that the Articles were finally going to take effect in 1781. One of Madison's favorite ideas at this point was the national government should have the, the authority to coerce the states into doing their duty. How would you do that? Well, all the states were coastal. If you had a couple frigates, you could simply close down their leading harbor and kind of bring them into some condition where they'd have to comply. It's a pretty naive idea, but it shows the seriousness with which Madison was thinking about these issues. More importantly, Madison became convinced in the early 1780s that the state simply could not be relied upon uh, in, a, you know, in a kind of consistent, regular, efficient way to carry out their federal duty. Uh, there are lots of reasons why the states were 
you were in that position. And really, many of those conditions just go to the enormous burdens that waging the Revolutionary War imposed on the states. I mean, the American states were compelled to fight a long and costly and expensive war against a very powerful enemy. Uh, they did not have the, you know, the experience or really the resources to know how would you mobilize the whole population uh, to su sustain a war that went on year after year from 1775 to 1781 and even a bit past that in you know, 1782. Uh, but Madison during this period became convinced that the whole system of relying on the states uh, was a system that was just you know, pr prone to failure. And so that problem starts to uh, preoccupy him. Um, but there wasn't much you could do about it. It had taken three and a half years to get the Articles of Confederation uh, adopted in the first place. How you go about immediately amending them was not obvious. Congress, in fact, did try to send out a, a one amendment in 1781, which failed. You should know that you know, to amend the Articles, just as uh, was needed to ratify them, you would need unanimous vote of all the state legislatures, which was you know, very difficult, not to say almost insuperable requirement. So it taken three and a half years to get the Articles ratified, and then Congress in 1781, then again in 1783, then again in 1784, sends out amendments to the states. I mean, I sincere at this point was you need to have, uh, you know, we should try to follow some kind of piecemeal set of reforms of the Articles. If we could get one or two amendments adopted and try to convince the American people, you could actually amend the Articles and, you know, uh, the skies were not open, you know, the, you know, um, you know, the, the country could cope, the country could adjust. That would be the optimal path of reform. The problem was it proved to be politically impossible to do that. Okay. So Madison was term limited out of Congress in the fall of 1783. Uh, he rides back to Virginia. I think I should wrote back with Jefferson, if I remember correctly. Um, and then he spent the next three years in the Virginia legislature, where he was the dominant member. Uh, you couldn't call him a prime minister. That would be a bit of an anachronistic term. But he was the dominant member of the Virginia legislature. Uh, when he served in the national government in Congress, he thought the principal problem was how do you get the states to do their duty. When he went back to Virginia, the principal problem he faced was how do you get his, his colleagues, the state legislators, to do what they were supposed to do, to recognize the importance of supporting federal measures and, and, and to take the appropriate actions. And Madison worked hard at that. He had some success and some failures. Uh, he came away from that experience deeply disillusioned. Uh, with the character of the state legislators he had to deal with. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use a phrase my, colleague, my friend and colleague Gordon Wood likes to use. He uses one essay where he said, <laughs> Gordon says, what can he do with such clods? Uh, which I think is a bit pejorative. Um, but it's true that Madison found that experience deeply disillusioning. I'm here, Madison was really kind of an early model of a professional politician, a guy who really had found his life in politics, dealing mostly with amateur lawmakers. You know, both in Congress and in the states, most people would serve a term or two, a year or two. There were high rates of turnover, high rates of rotation in the legislature. Nothing like the professionalization we've seen that affects both Congress and state legislatures now. So Madison was deeply serious about politics, and he was dealing with a bunch of amateurs. And he kept trying to get them to see, you know, what their duty was with very mixed results. So he tried that in Congress, think about how do you get the states to cooperate with the national government. And then he goes back to the states goes back to Virginia and he thinks about the difficulty of getting his, his, his colleagues to realize the importance and the gravity of what they were supposed to do. So he comes away from this being deeply disillusioned. And the upshot of this is that in 1786, 1787, Madison starts to formulate his own agenda of constitutional reform. I won't go through the history of this because it'll take too long. But there is one key document which illustrates this, which since I'm thinking this kind of as a class I'm teaching, you know, with, you know, Colleen's assistance here, or you know, Colleen following up. So this is uh, this is a famous text in American political history. Um, you can't really make it out there, but you know, this is the document we know is uh, Madison's title is "Vices of the Political System in the United States," and uh, uh, colleagues in the field we just call it the vices. You know, should, right, Colleen? That's kind of yeah, kind of the shorthand term for this. And you look at it. If you look at the manuscript, you see what I always thought was true from reading it. It's a working document. If, you know, if you're a modern lawyer, this is the equivalent of taking out an 8 by 11 you know, yellow pad and you know, working an outline of what you want to do. Because as you scroll through it, you see Madison leaves lots of spaces to, you know, to add additional points to it. Uh, you know, if he has further thoughts, there's room to, uh, you know, the, you know, the, there's room to add them and so on. Um, so I want, to I want to use this to talk about um, one item in particular. It's the item I've, I've, I've passed out. So everybody have a copy of this, 
attractively printed little green sheet. Um, so I happen to think that more than Federalist 10 or any other Madison text, this is the single most brilliant passage of political writing uh, in the history of the American Republic. Uh, it's where Madison pulls together his basic formula for explaining why a radical change in the nature of the American federal system is necessary. So it happens in the vices. Let me take a step back here. The vices is a memorandum where Madison you know, summarizes what he sees as the essential failings of the whole political system. It's not just the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the first uh, eight items do deal with the shortcomings of the Articles in general, and particularly the shortcomings of the state legislatures. And then in item nine, Madison shifts gears, and he starts talking there about um, the problem of the individual legislation of the states taken individually, not just how do they, you know, not just why they're not adequately complying with their federal obligations, what's going wrong with them uh, in terms of their own interior policy, their own internal police. I'll try to say a little bit something about that uh, before the end, because that's where Madison best explains why he thinks it's necessary to have a national negative on state laws. But in this single passage, this I think is actually the best example, uh, you know, the most important example of, of the, the basic way in which Madison was reasoning. Um, it illustrates, Mad I'd like to say this because I'm actually writing, finishing a book on this subject. It sh it's not just what Madison thought, it shows Madison thinking. It shows the activity of creative political thinking at a moment when Madison's trying to figure out what do we need to do. So it's not just a justification for an outcome, it's the explanation of how you get there, okay? So this is the item which Madison criticizes the whole idea of having a system of federalism based upon the voluntary compliance of the states with national measures. That's, that's the object of the criticism. So he starts, I think, you know, let's read this together. Uh, he starts by stating a problem. You know, the title is Want of Sanction of the Laws and of Coercion in the Government of the Confederacy. A sanction is essentially the idea of law as coercion is to that of government. In other words, if you can't enforce it, if you have no mechanism to compel you know, the responsible bodies to do what they're supposed to do, the whole system of government is going to be defective. The federal system, being destitute of both, wants the great vital principles of a political constitution. Under the form of such a constitution, it is, in fact, nothing more than a treaty of amity, commerce, and alliance between so many independent and sovereign states. That's the statement of the problem. And Madison asks his first question. From what cause could so fatal an omission have happened in the Articles of Confederation? And he starts off by giving us two answers. The first is a reflection on what things were like back in the mid-1770s, when the state constitutions, the Articles of Confederation, were being framed. He says, from a mistaken confidence that the justice, the good faith, the honor, the sound policy of the several legislative assemblies would render superfluous any appeal to the ordinary motives by which the law secure the obedience of individuals, a confidence which does honor to the enthusiastic virtue of the compilers as much as the inexperience of the crisis apologizes for the error. So what's Madison doing here? I'd love to ask my students, how is Madison reasoning here and say it's a trick question? If I say it's a trick question, they won't get it. He's reasoning like a historian. He's asking, how did people think at the time? How, what were we thinking at the time when the articles were adopted? But the basic answer then is at that point, the key word here is his use of the word virtue. Uh, we relied upon the enthusiastic virtue, meaning we expected citizens and, and legislators to do their duty. Virtue is a key word in 18th century political writing. Virtue is the obligation of a citizen, not to prefer your self-interest, but to do what you're responsible for doing. And so what Madison's saying, back then we were all Republicans. At this point, I want to emphasize lowercase r. We were all Republicans. We believed in Republican principles of self-government. Uh, we didn't think there was any need of coercion because we were patriots, and we were all going to do the right thing. So there's no need. There's no need for compulsion. So it was a sense. It seemed at the time it seemed like a sensible judgment. We didn't think you know what would happen if that Republican virtue began to lag. Then Madison offers a second historical reflection. It says the time which has since elapsed has had the double effect of increasing the light and tempering the warmth with which the arduous work may be revised. It is no longer doubted the unanimous and punctual obedience of 13 independent bodies to the acts of the federal government uh, ought, ought not to be calculated on. Even during the war when external danger supplied in some degree the defect 
of legal and coercive, coercive sanctions, how imperfectly did the states fulfill their obligations to the Union? In time of peace, we see already what is to be expected. So here Madison is again reasoning like a historian, except now he's not reasoning about what happened in the past. Why did they do it a certain way 10 years ago? Now he's saying, what have we learned since? What are the lessons of experience? And what we've learned, it was hard enough to make the system work during the war when there's a great external danger. Now that it's peacetime, we shouldn't be surprised that it's grown even more difficult to make the system work. And then Madison asks another question. And as I like to say, when Madison asks a question, it's not rhetorical, it's analytical. He's asking a question because he's identified a problem that deserves an answer. And he says, how indeed could it be otherwise? And at this point, the students should think, this is where I hope you guys have studied a little political science or economics. You should look at the, how Madison is reasoning here. He, now he gives us rapid fire, he gives us three uh, deeper structural explanations of why a system of federalism based upon the voluntary compliance of the states with national recommendations, rec uh, resolutions, and requisitions is doomed to failure. So it gives us three reasons very quickly. In the first place, every general act of the union must necessarily bear an equally hard on some particular member or members of it. Secondly, the partiality of the members to their own interests and rights, a partiality which will be fostered by the courtiers of popularity will naturally exaggerate the inequality where it exists and even suspected where it has no existence. Thirdly, a distrust of voluntary compliance of each other may prevent the compliance of any, although it should be the latent disposition of all. Now, if you guys have studied economics, I don't know if this is true or political science, you should recognize, or I'll, I'll try to suggest here, that what Madison is doing here is engaging in what we now call game theoretic reasoning. And I want you to think about this. It's game theoretic in this sense. Let's think of federalism as a game. We have a national government trying to get the states to comply. And the states have to make the decision, are we going to comply or not? Are we going to play the federal game? Are we, are we going to do what we're supposed to do? Or might we want to shirk or opt out of our obligation? And now Massa gives us three reasons for, uh, for saying why this game is not, this is not going to be a winning game. This is not a win-win situation. This is a very problematic game we're playing. So what are the three reasons? States have different interests. They won't be equally vested in the outcome of any decision. Secondly, within every state, we're likely to find individual politicians. He was thinking mostly of Patrick Henry in Virginia. And actually, Sada, I had to give the Patrick Henry lecture at, your, at, your, at Johns Hopkins with a Henry descendant there, <laughs> which if you're a Madisonian, that was a tough thing to do. You know, as Jefferson says of Henry, what we have to wish for uh, is his death to kind of get him out of the way. So I passed over that line. Anyhow, so the second thing here is within every state, we might well find politicians who want to run against Washington. You know, with state legislators sitting here, I'm not saying this is your position, but this is how Madison was thinking. Some group of state lawmakers will have their own incentives. You know, there may be good incentives, there may be improper incentives, but they will have some separate set of incentives. So we have to worry about that. And third, what I think is the best example, even when we all agree on the policy in the abstract, if we doubt whether others are going to comply, why, you know, why, why, should, why, should, why should we be the first ones to go forward? Why should we support federal policy if we wind up bearing the cost? Other states may, you know, may not bear their burden. It's a very powerful analysis. If you think about this, it really is game theoretic reasoning. Game theory exists in a kind of latent form at this time. I don't want to go into this. Condorcet and is working and so on. But Madison is kind of intu intuitively reasoning in this respect. And so he reaches his basic conclusion. Here are causes and pretexts which will never fail to render federal measures abortive. This is the critical decision. The critical decision that comes out of this, you know, when we think about Madisonian federalism, is that you need to create a federal system that in effect is going to cut the states out of the loop. It's going to make the national government independent of the states. The way the Articles of Confederation had worked was Congress would enact general policies. The states were expected to carry those policies out using their discretion to figure out the best way to do it within their own boundary. So the enforcement of national measures always depended upon the voluntary compliance of the states. The states were supposed to comply. That was their obligation under the Articles. It wasn't something they could vote up or down. They're expected to comply, but to do so in, 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 the, in, 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 the, in the most effective manner. Madison is saying here, this system is doomed to failure. 
this form of federalism will never work. It's always going to be prone to breakdown. What we need is a different form of government. That other form of government means that the national government needs to be able to legislate directly, not on the states, but on the American people. And if it's going to legislate directly on the American people, it has to look like a government in the normal sense of the term. It has to have a legislature. A legislature, therefore, should have two branches, you know, two houses, because that's, you know, that's the American expectation. We're tied to bicameralism. For better or for worse. It should have two houses. Um, it should have an independent executive. It should have an independent judiciary. It has to be a government in the full sense of the term. So I think I'm, this is the shortest version of explaining Madisonian theory of federalism. I don't know if Colleen agrees with this or not. We'll find out shortly. But the basic argument is any system of federalism based upon the voluntary compliance of the states with national measures is going to be, due to, is be prone to breakdown or failure. So we need to create a national government that's fully empowered to do its own business in which the states are no longer part of the loop. Now, this doesn't include the whole use of the funding power, you know, in modern American federalism to kind of induce, you know, coer I can't say coerce, but kind of induce, uh, you know, through one technique or other, the states to do what they're supposed to do. But, it, you know, but it, it, it does show the radical quality uh, of, of, of Madison's thinking. Okay. So that's you know so that so that's Madison's first you know first thing you know to have a working federal system, Madisonian federalism means we need to create a national government that is wholly independent of the states, that does not rely upon the states for enforcement. Um, Madison's own preference was not every state needs would need to be represented in the Senate, uh, and, uh, and and so on. Uh, the other critical part of this that Madison comes up with uh, is the negative on state laws, and this is. Um, you know, Madison, you know, on the basis of analysis, this analysis and other factors, Madison was convinced that the states, you know, could still, uh, you know, would continue to pose a real threat, real danger to the effective enforcement of national policy. He also felt that the states were, you know, were highly prone to continue to enact laws that are not only, they not only shirk their federal duty, uh, but they would actively, you know, uh, you know, impose on kind of violate the rights of individuals and minorities within their state. So Madison's own favorite proposal, you know, probably the, you know, perhaps the one proposal he valued most was to give the national government, give Congress a negative on state laws, meaning Congress would have the right to veto state legislation. Um, but for traders, Madison in a lot of ways truly was a radical thinker. So Madison went off to, you know, you know, to frame the Constitution in 77. Uh, had very radical ideas about the nature of the federal system he wanted to create. He wanted to create a national government that wholly independent of the states, A, in the first hand, and secondly, would have the ability, the capacity to be able to, in effect, to put the states in their place, uh, to negative their laws, uh, in part because he thought a lot of state laws will continue to interfere with national policy, but also because he worried about the rights of individuals and minorities within the states. He thought, I think correctly, this, you know, this may not accord perfectly well, you know, with your theory, but you know, he thought I think in some ways correctly that the greatest dangers to individual minority rights within the republic would arise not at the national level, but at the state level. And he wanted to create a national government that would be capable of overturning state laws, uh, a in case they interfered with national policy, and b in case they actually violated the rights of individuals and minorities. So as I sometimes like to say, that you know, you can make a plausible case that the most Madisonian part of the Constitution. Uh, is nothing that was written in 1787 or 1788. It's actually Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. It's actually the incorporation doctrine. It's actually the idea that the national government should play an active role in supervising and overturning state legislation uh, when it's perceived to violate the rights of individuals and minorities. Those are very Madisonian arguments, at least the matter for the Madison of 1787, 1788. So that's a, some fairly radical stuff I think I'm putting out here. Let me uh, let me try to wrap this up. I think with you know several points to be made about um, what actually happened at uh, the convention. Um, so this uh, so this is the opening analysis. What's my do I have another slide here to just to divert you? Yeah. Well, this is um, yeah, maybe a comment on this. Um, when Ma so Madison, this just a way of illustrating. Um, Madison's position. So this is item 11 from the, uh, the memorandum. 
uh, where Madison says he is, just to summarize his, 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 his concern about state laws, he says, if the multiplicity and mutability of laws prove a want of wisdom put in, in the state legislatures here, their injustice betrays a defect still more alarming. More alarming not merely because it is a greater evil in itself, but because it brings more into question the fundamental principle of Republican government, that the majority rule in such governments are the safest guardians both of public good and of private rights. So Madison's theory, in a sense here, is that national majorities will be safer than state-based majorities. Madison worries a lot about the nature of state-based majorities. Uh, you know, in some ways, actually, this picks up on your point. Uh, when we talk about the disparity in the current, you know, in, the, in, in our current political system, Madison worries a lot about state majorities being unjust majorities. Uh, he thinks actually to form a, to form a majority at the national level is going to take a lot more hard work. To reach a consensus at the national level, you really have to do some some serious deliberation. The state at the state level would be much easier to form a partial, biased, potentially unjust majority. So there is a real calculus here, as, as Madison thinks about federalism. Okay, so let me go on. I just I, you know I, I, I want to make several main points about the results of the Constitutional Convention. Then I'm going to turn the gavel, and, the, and, a bit, and even more better than the gavel, the microphone. Uh, over, over my distinguished colleague and co-editor, uh, Colleen Sheehan. Uh, so let me, let me just try to describe three basic results of the federal convention um, and the way in which I think they should get us to reflect on what we're calling here Madisonian federalism. First is there is, there is one basic ambiguity that we have to face when, when we think about what Madison set out to do. Um, when we look at the American structure of federalism and start with the Constitution, the most important text is Article I, Section 8, which gives us the enumerated powers of Congress. Uh, there was no similar, you know, if you look at the state constitutions, there's no enumeration of powers. The states have a general power to legislate. At the national level, we do have an enumeration, and the idea of enumeration implies a notion of limitation. It's a little hard to figure out exactly you know, how Madison thought about this. You know, at the start of the convention, uh, he endorsed a kind of general formula to say that, uh, you know, in effect, to, to give Congress a potentially open-ended legislative power, in effect, to do whatever is necessary for the collective public good. Um, but in, you know, in, in August 1787, the convention moved to a very different formula. And Article I, Section 8 is an enumeration of the powers of Congress. And it's a little hard to say, did Madison really believe that the Congress would just have a general legislative authority to do whatever was necessary for national good? Or is that just kind of a placeholder and not to be worked out until different rules of representation uh, had been determined? So a lot of this pivots on, you know, on the debate about uh, the Senate. Um, you know, the upshot is we do get um, Article 1, Section 8, which gives us the enumerated powers of Congress. And we do get the Tenth Amendment which some people think is significant and other people like myself think is actually fairly trivial, just restates what's already in the Constitution. But there is a kind of ambiguity about just how expansive a legislative power did Madison want to vest in Congress. Did he really want Congress to have an open-ended legislative authority? Or is that kind of a placeholder until you worked out other issues about how the states were to be represented, and then you could decide whether you need enumeration uh, or not? Um, second thing. Um, Madison did lose uh, the points that he valued most. Um, he did not want the Senate, the original Senate, to be elected by the state legislatures. He thought, and I don't mean to say anything that you guys would regard as insulting, but he thought that the state legislatures at that time were the central source of the vices of American politics. They were made up of amateur lawmakers. They came and went. Most state lawmakers would serve a session or two, and then they go back to their private lives. He felt they were domi uh, dominated by demagogic politicians like Patrick Henry. Uh, he wasn't very confident. He felt they really lacked the kind of the broad vision that you would need to, you know, to legislate uh, successfully. Um, so he didn't want a Senate elected by uh, the state legislatures, and he certainly did not believe in the equal state vote. Uh, he really wanted a Senate that would be a kind of quasi-aristocratic body. It wouldn't really represent the states at all. It was really meant to, to, to operate as a deliberate body that would be relatively removed uh, from pressure uh, from the state. So Madison, Madison's federalism, I think, rested upon this very enhanced notion uh, of, ha of having that kind of a legislature. Uh, he lost that. Um, and uh, he also lost the negative on state laws. 
some ways that was his favorite proposal, the idea that Congress would be able to negative state laws uh, in an open-ended way, um, whether they interfered with the authority of the national government or whether they you were, you know, had unjust results for the population of the states. So Madison lost the proposals he valued most. Uh, and in some ways, at least for the short period after the convention adjourned, he was, he was deeply disappointed by the results. Instead, what he wound up with was a system, I think, that was much messier, much more complicated, much, much more difficult to define than the one he ideally would have wished to have created. If Congress had a negative on state laws, uh, there would be no question that the states would be relegated to something less than their quasi-sovereign status. If every state law had to be, you know, was potentially subject to, you know, to, to not just a judicial review, but to congressional approval, there's no question that state legislatures would be relegated to a deeply inferior position. They could not be regarded as being sovereign in any sense of the term. But Madison lost that provision. That's one reason why he was deeply disappointed immediately after the convention adjourned, but then being a, a working politician, he got over his disappointment uh, you know, and, and worked to recover from it. Um, but instead, what he got was a, what, he, what he calls a compound republic. What he tried to explain was a system that was inherently messy, inherently hard to describe in its operation. If you wanted to make sense of how the, what the, the new federal structure was like, uh, you would have to be a real detail-oriented, uh, kind of very, you'd have to take a, a truly prosaic approach. You would have to actually spin out the multiple facets of the federal system. And the result would be not neat, but very messy. There was no simple way to explain what the American system was like. As Masson, Masson uses the phrase uh, later in his life, he calls it a real nondescript. When we say nondescript, we just mean kind of something that's kind of blah. You know, what Masson meant is it, there, was no, there was no model that the American federal system was following. The only way you could understand it was to work it out in its details. And when you did that, you would wind up with a truly messy system. Not a simple system to describe. And the example of this, I won't go through the details, but if you go and read Federalist 39, which is Madison's classic statement of this, Madison sets up, it gives us a set of criteria for trying to describe, is this more of a federal, is this more of a national system, meaning is it more of a system which the national government is going to dominate, or is it more of a federal system, meaning one that's based on the reliance of the states? And he goes through a set of operations you know, on who will the laws operate, et cetera, et cetera. He comes up with five criteria. Five is a lot. Five, is a, five criteria is a lot to ask anybody to keep in mind. And his conclusions are inelegant. He says, well, it's partly federal, partly national. Here it's federal. Here it's national. Here it's not, it's not really either or both. Or, you know, it's a very kind of complicated scenario. I won't go through the details. Uh, except to say that Madisonian federalism turns out to be a truly messy kind of entity to try to make any sense of. Uh, the only way to make the system work is you have to be willing to puzzle it out in its details. You can't have big theories about it. You have to kind of take it, I think, on a case-by-case, power-by-power, issue-by-issue basis. And so that's what alarms Madison most deeply in his old age. You know, Madison left the presidency in 1817, he has 20 years of retirement back at Montpelier. Let's get the, let's get the age of Madison back up. This is Madison, 1829. Uh, he spends a lot of time ruminating on American politics. He has a very active correspondence. People write to ask him, to ask his advice. And Madison gets very alarmed by the, the direction in which American thinking was going, by the insistence there would be either national supremacy on the one hand or states' rights on the other. I think what Madison imagined, uh, Madison imagined the federal system operating was you had to have the patience to work it out on a case-by-case, issue-by-issue, power-by-power basis. The simple theory that said either we have national supremacy because the Constitution was ratified by convention of the states, or there's some uh, primordial state sovereignty, this kind of South Carolina-style federalism, which can never be reversed, which can never be overturned. Madison understood that those efforts to simplify the federal system were kind of formulas for disasters, kind of either or propositions national supremacy or a kind of strong states' rights position. If you're sincerely American about, you know, and sincerely empirical about how to make sense of how the system worked, you had to try to figure out on a case-by-case basis, issue by issue, power by power, area by area. You had to do it in good faith. You know, you had to kind of find formulas for discussion and accommodation. Uh, you couldn't oversimplify uh, because that would, that would create real problems. 
So now at this point, I'm going to turn uh, the, the mic over to Colleen, and then you know, she'll do her bit. And then I guess after that, we'll, you know, we'll take some questions. Yeah, Colleen, you want me to read Madison up here?